let's talk about working into the upper register. This is a problem that frustrates a lot of young players and continues to frustrate a lot of older players too. I think the key about high register or just changing notes in an ascending fashion, it's really about trying to stay relaxed and efficient. That's a real important word, efficient. You don't want to feel like you ever have to muscle the high notes out. They're just like every other part of the horn. There's a couple things we can do to help that along. Number one, it's making sure that the student fully understands how to flow their air in a continuous fashion. With slurring, I earlier talked about that the air should expand all the time, so it should have a mini crescendo. It should always be uh, getting larger. And I think that's a great way to sort of be thinking about the upper register, because as we go higher, we need the air to go faster. But just getting the air to go faster by a mini crescendo is not going to be enough. There are two distinct things that you need to sort of be working on or talking about in the classroom when they go to the high register. But I'll start this conversation by saying don't use the word tighter when you're talking about upper register. All that does, particularly the young mind, is gets them to think about more tense rather than the size of the aperture. Really try and use less graphic words like I like to think smaller. It just doesn't mean the same thing. I have a sixth grader at home, as a matter of fact, and when I use the word smaller and he goes up, he tends to do way better than when he thinks about forcing or blowing up to the high note or tightening as he goes up. All right, so got to have this established airflow as they move up. Secondly, we got to use the parts of the body that will help us go up and get the air to go faster without forcing it out. For me, that tends to be the tongue and the mouth cavity working in coordination with each other. Um, when, you're, when we've worked on articulation in the past, when I've talked about articulation, I've used toe as a, a possible word, and I've used ta as a possible word, and I've used t. The reason I use these three different vowel sounds is because each one of them has a distinct setting for where the tongue is in the mouth. Say to yourself real quick, toe, and then ta, and then t. I think you're going to observe that the middle part of your tongue in particular is going to arch as you move upward. Is this a bad thing? No. In fact, I think it's a very good thing. A lot of brass players will think, no, no, you want that nice, huge, open mouth no matter what. That's true. The distance between the teeth needs to remain nice and open. The back part of the mouth cavity, where the sinus cavity is, the soft palate and all that, that needs to remain relaxed and open. But the middle part of the mouth, where the tongue is, all it's going to do is change the resonator directly behind the buzz we're trying to achieve. So don't be afraid that if you tell your kid or student to use a T sound, they're going to get a closed sound if they're in the upper register. I don't think that's true. All it will do is will match the resonator inside their mouth to the tone they're trying to produce. So simply getting them to think as they ascend, to -a -i, will help them get that velocity of air quicker and quicker as they go up. And I would use it just in that in that way, let's say the student were trying to achieve um, a seventh grader, trying to get a high F who's been struggling with it. So you had them working on a slur that went. That was the slur they were having problems with, and something like this was happening to them. I, I see this a lot. What they're trying to do in that case is they're keeping their mouth way too open and they're trying to just make the lips tighter and thinner. Eventually they hit the point of no return to where there's, they're so tight there's no vibration left inside the lips. So I'll work at this, not talking about the aperture yet. I'll say, no, no, let's work on getting your tongue to move upward, your mouth cavity to get smaller. And so I'll have them sing for me. Uh, I'll have them sing the slur for me. <laughs> and I'll reserve that E for the very top note. And then I have them go to the instrument, or sometimes I'll have them do it just on the mouthpiece. But usually I get a result, something like It wasn't perfect yet, but it's going down the right road, as you can hear. That top note definitely sounds a little thinner, maybe a little more pinched than the bottom one. I'll play it again for you. But you can see that I'm getting it a lot easier now. And all I've changed about how I was doing it from before is I'm using that tongue and I'm using that mouth cavity to get smaller as I go up. Now let's talk about the aperture, what it needs to do. The aperture needs to 
uh, expand and contract very similar to the way a camera aperture might expand and contract for the kind of shot a photographer was shooting for. It needs to get smaller and narrow down. It needs to expand wider to catch a larger picture. So low notes need to be taller and wider. High notes need to be shorter and smaller. The device to use or the controls to use to get, let this happen are really similar to, and I want to stress it's, they're only similar to and not exactly like, similar to the same controls we use when we whistle. So with young kids, and I've tried this with no, no problems in the end uh, of how to make an embouchure, I've had them work on just whistling or if they can't, doing a half whistle or a faux whistle. So I'll work at, let's say it was the same problem with the slur is what we're trying to achieve. I'll actually have them just blow air and try and whistle. And they might not be able to get that high note out. But what you'll observe when they do that is that they're making that aperture smaller. And you want to just directly point that out to them. See, as you got up, your aperture, the hole got a little smaller as you went up. Also, you probably noticed that your tongue went up when you whistled that. So you can reinforce a concept there. But it's basically using some muscles inside the mouth. And the main one we use when we change notes like that is called an abicularis. Not that you need to share the, the muscles of the mouth with your sixth and seventh grade students, but just so you're aware of the muscle. And that muscle encircles the entire lip area. And it'll, it's the one that allows us to pucker. It allows us to talk. It allows us to do lots of interesting things with our mouth, not, uh, the, the, the slur notwithstanding from that. So once you get them to whistle it, you, you then can go back to the instrument and say, okay, I want you to try and use your lips, the, the hole that's making the sound. I want you to try and use that whistling concept right there, but I want you to hold the embouchure firm everywhere else. Now, this is a little bit confusing to the young student, so you might want to work it away from the instrument first and have them try and whistle or half whistle. I think they'll get the idea and eventually, in time, could turn into if you'll utilize some of these concepts of mouth cavity, smaller uh, resonator, using vowel sounds such as O to A ah to E, and also thinking about the size of the aperture and instead of the tension of the aperture. Those are the concepts that I think will help your, your young students get the high notes out, as long as they have an airstream that's supporting that. So making sure that expanding air is still there. So to wrap it up, it's about expanding air, getting the air to move faster, but not necessarily harder, just getting it to move continuously and expand. Number two, using the mouth cavity to help that air speed get even faster and to help the resonator be appropriate for the tension that we're holding in the lips. And thirdly, using the aperture as a device to be smaller for the high notes and easily slide back out to a larger uh, aperture when we move back down low once again.